They operate in strictest secrecy, at the cutting edge of Australia's defence. They're creative, unorthodox and comfortable in chaos. For over 50 years, the Australian SAS has put their lives at risk, deep in enemy territory. This is the only television history ever supported by this highly secretive regiment. We take you beyond the stereotypes to reveal the unexpected story of the real people who set out to transform SAS from the ugly duckling of the Australian Army into Australia's force of first choice. Tet Offensive, America planned to pull out of Vietnam. The Australian task force in Phuoc Thuy found itself fighting a war that neither politician nor public any longer cared about. But SAS would have to fight three more long years before Australia would finally turn its back on fighting overseas. To disguise its withdrawal from Vietnam, America applied the public relations media strategy of the kill ratio, or body count. And they would start to wor worry about the kill ratio. And the idea was that uh, one uh, Caucasian should be able to kill uh, at least six or seven Asians uh, because of our superiority. Uh, and that, of course, uh, completely overlooked the uh, fighting ability of the uh, guerrilla army and the North Vietnamese army. Kill ratios claim that if you were losing fewer troops than the enemy, you were winning the war. But this was the grim logic of wars of attrition like World War I, the mindless metaphor of the last man standing. There became an emphasis to get and virtually payback, and that's what we felt it was like, a payback style of thing. And uh, so the top brass were really keen on how many did you get. An American general observed, if the combat infantry had the same kill ratio as SAS, there would be no Viet Cong left alive after a year. Kill ratio claims were accepted uncritically by press, politician and public in America and Australia. But SAS knew that losing a few good officers could damage the VC far more than losing an entire unit, and that kill ratio logic could be badly flawed. Uh, a good example of this is that we had a, a, a very major ambush in 1971 where we eliminated a, a, a fairly strong portion of the command element of 274 VC Regiment. There were two majors, company commanders, a political officer, the assistant chief of staff. The SAS squadron kill ratios were so high that SAS patrols were ordered to no longer just report VC movements, but to kill more VC, normally an infantry task. This political imperative to sustain the failing war effort made patrolling with SAS even more hair-raising. To destroy the jungle cover of the VC, the Allies sprayed herbicides. Defoliation exposed the VC, but also destroyed the cover that SAS patrols relied on. This area had very high trees, however they didn't have any uh, leaves on them, so there was no shade, there was no wind, it was very hot, the sun was beating down on us, uh, and we actually ran out of water. Um, the patrol was very dehydrated and... Uh, we were down to sucking uh, the juice out of the tins of peaches. We had 
little or no water left. We couldn't eat our rations because they were dehydrated, so we didn't have any water to eat those with. So I remember we sort of shambled down this uh, wadi uh, and we found a, a bomb damaged area and at the bottom of one of these bomb craters was uh, some pretty mucky looking water with slime on top. And uh, we did all our protection and did all the bits, but we went down singles or in pairs and uh, just dipped our sweat rags in and squeezed the moisture into our mouths. And uh, then we uh, got into a secure location and asked for either exfil or a resupply of water and rations. I was received a message from the uh, squadron commander and he said the message was, you are SAS troopers, tighten your belts, you will stay in. The frustrated SAS knew it should be better used strategically outside Phoc Thuy. SAS could interdict the vital Ho Chi Minh supply trail and train up guerrilla forces. SAS could also rescue prisoners of war and conduct long-range psychological operations. But generally, at the task force level, they didn't really understand how we operated, our limitations and potential. One officer observed that the way SAS was used in Vietnam was like harnessing the winner of the Melbourne Cup to a plough. Some SAS soldiers did get out of Phoc Thuy briefly in exchanges with US Navy Special Forces SEAL teams in the Mekong Delta. Under the CIA Phoenix program, the SEALs attacked VC infrastructure and rescued American and South Vietnamese prisoners kept in cages. Despite Task Force ignorance of its potential, SAS did at times achieve its preferred strategic role. SAS intelligence enabled the infantry to crack the notorious VC safe haven in the Mai Town Mountains, an area of dense jungle in the northeast of Phoc Thuy. Perhaps we could have been used better rather than just getting body count. Uh, at one stage, um, Brigadier Pearson, uh, Sandy Pearson, he utilised this brilliantly. He uh, put a series of patrols along a, an infiltration route for stores, big stores. And so each of the patrols would stay in contact with each other and I, I would radio to you. There's a group of 20 coming down, the lead man has got so, such and such a bandana on his neck or, or some uh, identifying thing. If they went past you, you would radio that further down the line until finally that group didn't turn up at the last post. So therefore, you can then make the assumption they've turned off that line and they're storing it somewhere in, in between these two locations. And finally, uh, a patrol led by Bernie Considine, he found the turn off and he found a monstrous supply of uh, stacked stores in the jungle. He's talking about 20 foot high stacks of stores. And so that technique really paid off and we felt uh, justified in our role there. It didn't matter that we didn't shoot anybody or anything like that. We'd found a major uh, store supply. But Canberra wanted small SAS teams to do the killing, to keep task force casualties down, because the deaths of young Australian soldiers cost votes. Canberra also began to limit the dollar cost of its task force, especially helicopters. They were expensive to run and were sitting ducks during SAS operations. And SAS teams were too small to fight for long before needing helicopter rescue. Patrols often had to fight the VC on the run for hours before a helicopter could be spared. Commander came up to, to a farewell briefing of one squadron all sitting in the opera house that we had there. And uh, they were expecting a pat on the back, job well done fellas and Godspeed home. But uh, one of the statements made by him was, it's about time you SAS bastards learned how to die. You're nothing but a drain on me resources. And so that went over really well.
Ultimately, the intense strain on SAS of continued patrolling began to tell. Some soldiers were fighting in Vietnam for a second or even third time. We replaced one squadron. Um, they all looked pretty buggered, pretty knackered actually, um, very skinny. Uh, and we looked in, and you could just see the tension and stress uh, from their facial expressions. I mean, they, they are absolutely buggered. It's often believed that the SAS soldiers uh, in Vietnam were cool, calm, tough, aggressive, brave soldiers. Well, the truth of it is, I think generally speaking, that is the case. But often we're also too very, very human. Uh, we felt fear, terror, and there were times often where men used to stop in their tracks and start to shake because of the close proximity of the enemy. And I was one that had irritable bowel. I had no idea at the time. But it got to the point where I was showering and the excrement used to run down my legs in the shower because I couldn't control my bowels. By 1970, the Australians had pacified Phoc Thuy and there was a lack of suitable SAS tasks. SAS even began using tracks hoping to find VC. The task force began pursuing VC units into adjoining Long Khan province. And it was apparent, I think, to us that uh, the war, in terms of a clear outright win, military win, uh, was probably not going to happen. It was just a matter of if and when um, we would be withdrawn. The unit probably wasn't war weary in any sense, but certainly there was a, you know, an undercurrent of, well, you know, we've had a fair old bash at this and maybe it's time to move on. SAS was hugely successful against the communists in Vietnam, inflicting major strategic damage on VC infrastructure and morale with their superior anti-guerrilla warfare tactics. Although many Allied units suffered heavy casualties in Vietnam, SAS only lost a few soldiers to accidents and only one soldier to enemy fire. But as in Borneo, SAS operations were still top secret and neither the army at large nor the public would learn for decades what SAS had achieved. By Christmas 1971, the Australian task force had left Vietnam. Returning Vietnam veterans were given a hostile reception by press and public, for Vietnam was now a dirty word. As SAS entered the peacetime doldrums, no one imagined it would face decades of no wars to fight. Defence Force and Army were looking for the direction of what was required of it after Vietnam, and there was a vacuum. The Army went into what you might call a post-operational depression. The manpower was cut back, finance was cut back, it was a period in which the regiment basically had no enemy to train to or for or against. Some SAS soldiers couldn't tolerate the enforced inactivity and resigned to chase their adrenaline high in travel and adventure or even in training foreign armies. I decided to uh, go to Rhodesia and join the Rhodesian SAS, which is now called Zimbabwe. Um, over there, uh, well, it definitely wasn't for the money I went over there. It was uh, mainly to get away from the political climate of Australia and also um, for more adventure, I suppose. Others eagerly took the chance to catch up on family life. If there's been a waste in the use of um, SAS, Certainly the period after Vietnam, um, there was a loss of direction.
media now turned away from trying to fight communism on the Asian mainland. The new so-called Fortress Australia policy aimed to defend Australia against a seaborne Asian invasion of our shores. The Air Force and Navy would destroy the invader at sea and the army would mop up any who made it to land. In this defence scenario, no training for overseas operations was permitted and SAS would no longer be needed. For SAS, its own government was about to become a more serious threat than the Viet Cong had ever been. When I joined SAS in 1977, it was clear that the 1976 white paper was placing the regiment under threat with all the downsizing that it was going to drive and this concentration on continental defence. There was a distinct belief that SAS would become obsolete, be disbanded. There would be no role for the Special Air Service in the concept of defence of Australia. There was discussion constantly in SAS about our role in Defence of Australia and how appropriate our role would be. And the difficulty was always, was this a credible threat? Was the landing of military forces from the north on mainland Australia uh, really the threat? And it never seemed credible. Based on this assessment, SAS began to study the counter-terrorist and hostage rescue training that Britain's 22 SAS had already begun. Now, people need to remember that the 1970s was a period awash with terrorism. The Red Brigades, the PLO, the PLFP. We'd had bombs put in hotels in Sydney. There'd been assassinations in Australia. Terrorism was on everyone's mind. In 1970, four aircraft bound for New York were hijacked by the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, and three were flown to the remote Dawson's Field airstrip in Jordan. The PFLP released most passengers, but kept 56 Jewish hostages before destroying the planes. Hijacking proliferated, and the West looked on helplessly as a new era of asymmetric warfare spread around the globe. So SAS started to direct training towards the aspect of unconventional warfare. But it was almost seen as a boutique subject by Army. And later on, it was seen as getting in the way of the main game, which was this defence of Australia. SAS began teaching skills that would prove an essential part of the SAS repertoire. The men learnt new techniques in industrial sabotage and demolitions and mastered the invaluable skill of stalking and sniping. For the first time, troops trained in close quarter battle. Hand-to-hand -hand street fighting required quick reflexes and agility, as did skirmishing in confined areas such as streets and buildings. But SAS, for its own survival, had to become part of the Fortress Australia mindset. Special Action Forces Director, Colonel Mike Jeffrey, produced a win-win solution. SAS would patrol Australia's remote, vast and vulnerable northern coastline. I think he and successive COs found our place. Uh, as a surveillance screen to defend continental Australia and in a way that was spreading the special forces um, concept uh, and applying it to the defence of Australia at that time when the defence of Australia was all the focus. I believe it was a great credit of Michael Jeffrey that he identified a role for us within that where he had us uh, very much playing a observer and then guerrilla role in the defence of Australia, even though most of us didn't believe in it, but we saw it as necessary to preserve the regiment as relevant to this flawed strategic concept. SAS patrolled huge distances with ageing Land Rovers and trail bikes. 
They also experimented with camels, which they captured in the wild and trained for patrolling in the dry season. Camels had the advantage of not disturbing the wildlife and could travel enormous distances in dry country. SAS learnt survival skills, such as living off the land, to help teams escape and evade the enemy. We also used Les Hiddens, the Bush Tucker man, to help our people develop a capability of operating in that environment. Les has an outstanding relationship with many of the indigenous people that he has operated with over the years, and he was able to introduce our people to them. The survival course was a course that taught us all to live off the land. Taught us all to make the best out of nature and what nature could provide. The, uh, the bush was uh, like a supermarket, but sometimes the shelves aren't quite so stocked. Well, the supermarket that I was in, the shelves were pretty lean and uh, we did it pretty tough. But, uh, you know, we, uh, uh, we were able to make fires with uh, rubbing sticks together and uh, we had our little survival kits and we found water holes and we caught fish and we learned to navigate by the stars. Celestial navigation was a great skill and one that I uh, try to keep today. Jeffrey's idea for northern surveillance was proven beyond doubt in exercise long vigil, when SAS patrols, largely avoiding detection, tracked an enemy force that had landed near Darwin. But patrolling the north was really too big a task for SAS, and watching Australia's empty northern approaches was a relatively simple job. In northern surveillance, SAS talents were not being used. Colonel Jeffrey saw to the raising of three long-range reconnaissance units to relieve SAS. The Northwest Mobile Force, or NOR Force, at Darwin would patrol the entire Northern Territory and the Kimberleys. The Far North Queensland Regiment at Cairns would patrol Far North Queensland. The Pilbara Regiment at Karratha would patrol most of Western Australia. The territory that these regional units had to patrol was vast. A few hundred men had to monitor an area almost half the size of the USA. In the early 90s, I had the opportunity to command the Northwest Mobile Force, which is known as North Force, some 600 members, many of whom are indigenous. English was a second language to 75% of that unit. SAS had been instrumental in the early days in the creation and the development of North Force and indeed the other two surveillance regiments. These units included ex-SAS soldiers and used SAS methods of raising local forces as they had done in Borneo. They networked extensively with Aboriginal settlements, talked to local fishermen and police and visited remote cattle stations to monitor the isolated coast and hinterland. But the main game, terrorism, had already arrived in the cities of the South. In 1979, the focus on continental defence shifted dramatically when the Hilton Hotel in downtown Sydney was bombed. Overnight, Australia had become a target for international terrorism and its splendid isolation had vanished. When terrorists planted a bomb, outside the Hilton Hotel in Sydney during the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in the late 70s. It not only bombed the hotel, it put a bomb under the Fraser government. Suddenly, government saw that it needed a capability to defend us from terrorism and that that capability needed to be raised quickly and people looked to the SAS regiment. SAS became the secret spearhead of counter-terrorist forces in Australia. It trained in strict secrecy to protect soldiers' identities and conceal their tactics and strategies. But in 1980, a British 22 SAS CT squad broke the Iranian embassy siege in London. SAS was thrust into the spotlight. After an explosion at the back of the embassy, the SAS go into action. As the spectacular hostage rescue unfolded, it was broadcast live on television around the world. For the first time, the public learned of this secret force. 
And then Sim Harris, held on the first floor, scrambles to safety, beckoned by another SAS soldier. But the secret of British SAS was appalled by this massive public exposure of its existence. For two decades, terrorist attacks targeted Western commercial aviation. In 1988, Libyan agents bombed Pan American Flight 103 over the Scottish village of Lockerbie, killing all 243 passengers and 16 crew members. In 1990, Colonel Jeffrey commented that a terrorist flying into Sydney first class on a 747 to plant a bomb was a much more likely threat to Australia than an invading Asian armada. Jeffrey's assessment was not welcomed by Fortress Australia thinkers. But the climate of fear was growing in the West. Small terrorist groups could now hold powerful nations to ransom. The Australian government was finally forced to accept that merely defending Australia's coastline was no answer to the rising threat of asymmetric war and looked to SAS to provide a solution.